Hey guys, um, uh, this is a sermon I shared on uh, Thanksgiving Eve. Tonight's message will revolve around a character who represents the way many people think about salvation in Christ. Consider this a one-act play that will endeavor to portray both law and gospel under the question, what must I do to be saved? Good evening. My name is Christian. I've been going to church since I was a kid, and I love the Lord Jesus. I believe that he suffered and died and rose again to save me from the weight of my sin. This is my confession, and I was quite secure in it until a friend of mine made me question the sincerity of my faith. You see, he told me about all the things he did as a Christian. He prayed for hours at a time, memorized chapters of scripture regularly. He has gone on mission trips and made sure to attend worship every Sunday, all to show the Lord that he is a strong Christian. Then he asked me what I did. I told him that I pray, but not regularly, that I confessed that I do believe in Jesus, but have not gone to the length he has. I'm quite familiar with scripture, but I have not worked to commit much to memory. He asked me, do you confess your sins? Well, of course I confess my sins. I do this every Sunday and many times more in the pri privacy of my own home. But my confession, my confession sounded a little weak. I asked him, do you think I'm missing something? He appeared to ponder my question, but I had a feeling he already had an answer. He then said to me, you can't believe that all you have to do is believe in Jesus, and that makes you a Christian. Actually, that's exactly what I believed. I mean, I did not think that you could ignore God's word the rest of your life and think that you are still having a relationship with Jesus and that there was surely a response to owning the Christian faith. But I did not believe that Jesus just started something that we had to finish. All I could do was respond to say no. At that point, I began to question my walk with Jesus. Have I been doing it all wrong? Well, days went by, and all I could think about was that God had a checklist of my works and that there were a lot of things unchecked. The night before Thanksgiving, I felt worse. I thought that God was trying to convince me to begin working out this checklist. I opened up the Bible and started trying to read various scripture passages, and I, I came across Matthew 7, 15-20. It said, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruits you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. I stared at these words for what felt like hours. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. These words were like a death sentence. What fruit have I yielded? My friend did all those activities. My faith no longer seemed to be enough. I prayed for hours. Please, Lord, please forgive me. I know I have just asked you this, but I have no comfort. You have placed upon me a burden that is too heavy. Please, Lord, please forgive me. I promise I will pray longer and read more scripture. I want to be worthy of your gift. I could not sleep. I felt I had nothing to be thankful for because my entire life seemed to just take God for granted. Whatever works I did do did not seem sufficient. I read further that God also demanded perfection. It says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's Matthew 5, 48. I was not perfect. I wasn't even close. Galatians 3.27 reads, For as many of you 
as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Was the cleansing upon me through my baptism supposed to have made me into someone worthy of Jesus, or was it only a stepping stone? I sure felt like that was what I was reading. It was Thanksgiving Day, and I felt I had nothing to be thankful for. How does a prisoner thank his executioner? Going to church became an act of obedience rather than an act of worship. Hymns were sung, and I could not lift up my head. We confessed our sins, and I remained kneeled as others stood. God had to notice that I loved him. I really was sorry for my sins. I was praying more. I had probably read more scripture in these past few days than I have in a year, but none of that comforted my broken spirit. Soon, at worship, the pastor began his sermon. In the name of the Father, the bread of life, dear family, he began. That pastor reminded us that just before today's gospel reading, Jesus miraculously fed 5,000 men, not including women and children. He did this with just five loaves of bread and two small fish. When all was said and done, there were 12 baskets of leftovers. The physical need of God's people was met. He then said, Tonight's gospel shows us the Lord's priority. Now that Jesus had filled the people's bodies with bread, it's time to fill up their souls with the bread that gives life. He then asked, What must we do to obtain it? That question woke me up the way an alarm wakes a sleeping man. That was my question. What must I do? The pastor continued. The previous evening after the miraculous feeding, Jesus sent the disciples back by boat to the other side of the lake, where he went into the hills by himself to pray. Later that night, while the disciples struggled to make sure, Jesus walked out to them, and once in the boat, they immediately made landfall. The next morning, the crowd that stayed on the other side of the lake couldn't find Jesus. They hired fishing boats to transport them back to the other side. Upon getting home, the first thing the people decided to do was look for Jesus. When they found him, they asked him, Rabbi, not Master or Lord, but Teacher, when did you get here? Jesus knew the selfishness of their hearts and called them on it. You're looking for me, he disciplined them, not because of the miracles I did to prove that I am the promised Redeemer. You're looking for me because you're looking for your stomachs to be filled again. Then Jesus commanded them, Do not work for food that spoils, but for the food that endures to our eternal life. To which the people asked that ever-important question, what must we do to do the work God requires? In other words, what must we do to be saved? Again, these words caught my attention. The pastor paused as if he was allowing God's word to sink in. I realized that everything hinged on Jesus' answer. I needed to hear the list of requirements that I have been missing all these years. It seemed like the pastor was taking forever to answer to his own to answer his own question. Jesus said, "The work of God is this: to believe in the one He has sent." See, see, I wanted my friends to hear these words because they were my own until all this confusion. At that moment, God was helping me to see my error. All throughout our days, we must work for everything that we've required, acquired, and so, so why not include salvation in that package? Today, we have so many things that make our lives easier. We get microwaves and instant meals and instant access to online information. Therefore, it makes sense to me the work of Christ as his way um, to give us a boost, a hand up, if you will, as if it wasn't a gift but an effort for us to finish. But if you think about it, if we define Christ and his work as being a line, in line with all our work, then we really do not have a savior at all. If you are hungry and 
a person feeds you once, does that make him your savior? Well, not unless you plan on dying soon after. No, we will be looking for more help later on in the day. Therefore, God's work must not be constrained. And God's work must also not be diluted with our works, as if the Almighty could not do enough. Jesus said, and these are his own words now, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Yes, yes, this was for me. This is the answer to the question that was on my heart. This question that has been burning a hole within my spirit. You see, I thought if I tried hard enough, God would accept me for who I am. If I do more good than bad, I'll lean more towards God's favor. But God does not tell us to be 10 or 20% good. No, he commands us be perfect all the time in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. It was a vicious cycle I was in. I caught my mind wandering on this revelation and focused again on the pastor's sermon. At this point, he was telling us a story. Here's the story. There was a man lost in the desert. He was dying of thirst. In the distance, he saw an old shack. He thought he found a place to die. He prayed for a little shade before it was all over. Once he reached the shack, he saw an old rusty water pump, and he stumbled over to it. He grabbed the handle and began to pump it up and down, up and down, but nothing came out of it. Disappointed, he staggered back. He noticed off to the side there was an old jug, and he looked at it and wiped away the, the dirt and the dust and read a message that said, you have to prime the pump with all the water in this jug, my friend. And P.S., be sure you fill the jug again before you leave. He popped the cork out of the jug, and sure enough, it was almost full of water. Suddenly, he was faced with a decision. If he drank the water, he could live, uh, yeah, but if he poured the, all the water into this old, rusty pump, maybe it would yield fresh, cool water and all the water that he wanted what should he do the pastor asked a member of the congregation yelled pour it in take a leap of faith the pastor said that's exactly what the old man did he took a chance but to be so thirsty and just toss the water away is crazy right no that's what the pastor, pastor said. No, it, it, it was an act of complete trust. The old man trusted in what someone else promised and poured all the water into the pump. Then he grabbed the handle and began to pump it, and it squeaked as he did, and still nothing came out. And He tried again, and it squeaked some more, and finally this little bit of water began to dribble out. Then a small stream, and then finally the water gushed. To his relief, it was cool water that was poured out of this rusty pump, and eagerly he filled the jug and began to drink from it. He drank from the entire jug and then filled it up again and drank some more. Then he filled the jug for the next traveler. He filled it to the top, popped the cork back on, and added this little note. Believe me, it really works. You have to give it all away before you can get anything back. The pastor summed up the meaning of the story. Faith is the hand that receives what God has to offer. Faith never earns or merits anything, but accepts quite a lot. Or as the hymn Rock of Ages defines it, nothing in my hand I bring simply to the, this cross I cling. And I thank you, Pastor Meyer, for this observation. I thought to myself that this old man in the story was empty of everything except faith. He was about to trust in what was provided. The pastor read the gospel lesson and heard him again say, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. When the jailer at Philippi asked Paul and Silas what he must do to be saved, the apostle didn't rattle off a list of rules and regulations. 
They simply stated, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's in Acts 16.31, by the way. When Jesus visited the home of Mary and Martha, Martha was busy preparing the meal while Mary was listening to Jesus teach. When Martha objected, Jesus told her, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary had chosen and what was better, and it will not be taken away from her. And that can be found in Luke 10, verse 41 and 42. So what must we believe? For the people, Jesus' answer of simple faith saving them was too good to be true. So they wanted reassurance with another miracle. They acted like the crowd that has already seen the magic act of vanishing in the closet. Now they wanted to act or that act to be topped. Apparently yesterday's feeding of the 5,000 wasn't good enough. They asked, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. That was sort of like saying, hey Jesus, can you do better than Moses over there? So Jesus corrects them. It wasn't Moses who fed Israel, but God. Also, it is better to have food for the soul than food for the body. The food for your soul comes from the Redeemer of all men. When they asked for better bread, Jesus said those words, we have all come to know. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never go thirsty. There is much to be thankful for when we approach our Lord in prayer. The thankful heart does not demand God to one-up himself. The thankful heart does not measure God's love through what he provides or does not provide. The thankful heart praises the Lord both sickness and health, both in sickness and health, while trusting that the bread of life far outweighs any temporary measure. What we also learn today is that the thankful heart is always thankful because God has done all the work. Yet we were, yet while we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He answers fully our deepest question, that being, what must I do to be saved? Our Lord has taken away from us the one thing the world demands, and that is our effort. Our effort is not attached to our salvation, because if it was, we could never truly be thankful. We would always be in despair as our works are like filthy rags to God. Even believing on the name of Jesus is all God's doing. The Holy Spirit maintains our faith through His Word and, and His gifts. Doesn't this remind you of a full spread of food on, on Thanksgiving? So remember this. Jesus did not run away from the weight of our sins. Rather, he carried them with him to his death. Jesus did not cower in the face of death, but was victorious over it. Now, because of his resurrection and ascension, we have this eternal promise, which says, Because I live you also will live. That can be found in John 14, verse 19. How much do we love our Lord for paying our debt in full and extending our days with him for all eternity? My friends, God doesn't always give us the answers we think we want, but he does give us the, give us the answers we need. Jesus assures us, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never grow hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. You see, the giver is himself, the gift. The revealer is himself, the revelation. Jesus alone saves. What must we do? Believe on the name of our Lord Jesus, the name placed upon us through his word and his gifts. That's the answer to our question. And if you ever doubt it, go look in God's word and reread these words to encourage you and remind you that what God has given to us is a wonderful gift and has nothing to do with what we do. Happy Thanksgiving.